All right. Questions? The triangular inequality? Sure. Okay. If we're going to do the triangular inequality, which is the idea of I want to prove, which basically show to be true, that the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y is going to be greater than or equal to x plus y. Absolute value. Um, before we do anything, you know, with any sort of proof is to know what we're dealing with as we go through the problems. And one of the things we have to worry about is we have these symbols here, like the absolute value. And we'll see a bar symbol like this a lot on different sorts of problems that represent different ideas. Uh, in linear algebra, it means the determinant, but they all have a, a kind of a fundamental concept about magnitude or measure. And the absolute value of x, there's certain things everybody knows. Like, for example, what's the absolute value of 6? Six? 6. What's the absolute value of negative 3? Right? And so, why? You kind of get to this question of, it's we've been doing things, but one of the things you have to understand in particular is you have to have a rule of doing it. So if a number is non-negative, the absolute value does nothing. On the other hand, if a number is negative, like the absolute value of negative 3 was 3, how did you do that? How did you turn a negative 3 into 3? You said, well, I made it positive. But we have to have a mathematical thing that makes it positive. And the way that we could do that is just to throw on an extra minus. Right? Because x is negative, because x is negative, this thing is actually what? It's positive. I see a minus in front of it, but it's a positive quantity because the thing that I'm doing a minus of is negative. So this is actually negative, negative makes it a positive. Is everybody okay with that idea? That that's how we make positives out of negatives, is throw an extra sign on it, it becomes minus, minus. But that also tells us that when we're doing any problems, if you see a minus on something, you have to say a timeout, I don't know what this is. And the absolute value does different things to different objects. If it's non-negative, it leaves it alone. If it's negative, it throws an extra minus on it to make it positive. So we have to know that to figure out what in the world absolute value of x plus absolute value of y greater than or equal to x plus y. How do we do that? The second is, if I take problems and I say real numbers, <coughs> the absolute value let's say we have over here is 6, and let's say over here is minus 3. The absolute value of minus 3 is actually measuring how far something is from the origin. The absolute value of 6 being 6 is how far is it from the origin. It's this idea of mag how far are you away from 0 in a positive sense. Distance is always measured. Typically is positive, even though we take calculus, we have a net signed area. We have negative values because we're adding up. You can calculate negative areas and positive areas knowing that it's a sum of positives or negatives. So this particular problem, the absolute value, represents these. Now doing that, this is our background. We have enough algebra and enough, ar enough arithmetic to understand certain features of numbers. And we would look at this and say, all right, the absolute value behaves differently for negatives and non-negatives. I have a problem that has the absolute value in it. And I want to show that it's greater than or equal to. It has a property. Well, that means that if I'm going to do this problem, I'm going to ask, how do negatives and non-negatives interact? Because if I would look at this and I want to show this is true for all numbers, I can break up my numbers the x's and y's into is x less than 0? Is x greater than or equal to 0? Is y less than 0? Is y greater than or equal to 0? Is x to the left of the 0? Or is x to the right? We're at 0. Is y to the left and is y to the right? The absolute value will behave differently depending on which one I pick, right? So I need to pick all reals, but it does something different in different places. So knowing that, 
those are the things that I can bust this up, this will become four cases, right? So if I said, pick some numbers for x and y, well, I'm going to have case one, which is say, how about, what if I pick x to be less than zero and y to be less than zero? What would case two be? Well, how about let's pick the non-negatives. What about x greater than or equal to zero and y is greater than or equal to zero? Well, what would case three be? Well, how about x is less than zero and y is greater than or equal to zero? And what's case four? Well, what if x is greater than or equal to zero and y is less than zero? Is everybody okay with those being the four ways that I could pick x's and y's in terms of how they behave with the absolute value? Every one of those cases will behave differently for its absolute value. Now, do I actually have to do case three and four separate? Because really, case one says what? Both are negative. Case two is both are non-negative. Case three says one is negative and one is non-negative. What's case four? One is non-negative and the others. Honestly, X and Y are arbitrary. So are, without loss of generality, is it enough to say, okay, one's negative, the other is non-negative, and it doesn't really matter which? Because it doesn't matter if I pick X or Y, I just flip the order, the name. Call one X, call the other Y, call one Y, call the other X. I don't care. So really, I could simply say that these are actually the same. Same without loss of generality. Really what it says is one is neg, one is non-neg. Do I care that? I don't care which. It would solve the thing. Because if I look at the original problem up there, now on the other hand, if I put a 2 on the y, y is different than x. And I couldn't just simply say, because if I look at that, is there a symmetry going on here for the x's and y's? If I would have renamed it t's and q's or flipped the order of the y and x, it would still be the same problem. But if I put something like this, X is behaving differently than Y. So th now I wouldn't be able to do the without loss of generality because X's are different than Y's. Okay. So what do I want to do? For each of those three cases, so I'm going to put stars here, I'm going to do this problem, and I'm going to do this problem, and I'm going to do this problem. I need to show for each of the three stars, we need to show that the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y needs to be greater than or equal to the absolute value of x plus y. Okay. Perfect. I'm going to do case two first. x is non-negative and y is non-negative. So I'm going to take both numbers to either be 0 or to the right. I'm picking non-negative numbers. That's the only thing I'm going to take. All right, if that's true, then what's the absolute value of x? x. What's the absolute value of y? What is the absolute value of x plus y? All right. Here comes a, a thing that we need to understand about numbers, right? One of the things that we have to understand about numbers is x is what? Non-negative. Say positive, right? Zero doesn't matter. What's y? Non-negative. What's a non-negative plus a non-negative? A non-negative. Does that make sense? Positive plus positive is positive. It's not impossible to become negative. It just gets bigger. Take numbers and add a number that's positive, it just has gotten larger. Because this is po this is non-neg, these are both non-neg, the entire thing is going to be non-negative. Because I have a non-negative plus a non-negative, it is a non-negative. That's a closure property of addition of positives, including the zero. What does the absolute value do to that? If x plus y is non-negative, what's the absolute value going to do? Leave it alone. Absolute value of anything is, spits it right back out, does absolutely nothing to it if it's a non-negative number. All right, now let's check. 
what's the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y? This is supposed to be greater than or equal to the absolute value of x plus y, right? I've already gotten the left. It's x plus y. Is this greater than or equal to x plus y? Yes, that is true. So case two is true. We're good? Let's go to case one. Case one is x is a negative and y is a negative. Okay, if that's true, what's the absolute value of x? Minus x. Why? I have to make it positive. It's a negative number. I need to make it positive. It makes it positive by throwing an extra minus on it. And by the way, minus x is a positive. Is everybody okay with that? That this minus x is a positive number. That's how I made it positive. I took a negative, threw a minus on it, got an extra negative, now it's positive. What's the absolute value of y? Negative y. What's the absolute value of x plus y? All right. Both of these are negatives. What's a negative plus a negative? It is negative. And what does the absolute value do to negative numbers? Make them positive by giving them an extra minus. Everybody good? All right. Let's go ahead and consider what we were supposed to do. Is it true that the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y is supposed to be greater than or equal to x plus y? Well, that's minus x plus minus y. Is this greater than or equal to a minus x plus y? Those are actually equal, so this is true. It's equal to, just like the other one was equal to. All right, so now what do we know? This triangular inequality works if you pick both numbers on the right or both numbers on the left. Now comes the more interesting problem. What if one's on the right and the other's on the left? That's what case three is about. It doesn't matter which you pick, so we'll just pick one. So case three was, what, what did I write up above? The x is on the left and the y was on the right. So x is, x is on the left. Kirk. X is a negative number, and Y is a non-negative number. So X is to the left-hand side, Y is to the other side. All right, there's certain things that are easy. What's the absolute value of X? Minus X, which happens to be, this is important, a positive. What's the absolute value of Y? Y, because it's a positive, it leaves it alone. Here's the interesting question. What is that? Well, here's the thing. X is a what type of number? Negative. So this is a negative. This is a positive or non-negative, right? I'll just say positive for now. If I have a negative number plus a positive number, what operator do I actually have? Not addition, but subtraction. And subtraction can give me two different answers. What if the positive number magnitude is larger than the negative number? And I subtract the two, like 5 minus 3. I get a positive, and the absolute value would do nothing. But what if the number was 3, and I was taking away negative 5? If the negative is bigger, magnitude-wise, I get a negative. And what would the absolute value do? Make it positive by throwing on an extra sign. So I have two more cases. I have subcases now. I go, if y is quote unquote bigger, is further from zero than x, this will behave differently than if x is further from zero than y, because one would be positive and one would be negative. And so it really depends on what happens. So, what's going to happen here is this negative number and this, say, non negative number. <coughs> 
is either going to do one of two things. A, it will be either x plus y, or B, it'll be minus x plus y. When will it be x plus y? It'll be x plus y if y is bigger than x, which would be right magnitude-wise. What I mean by bigger, it means it's it's as in a subtraction, so that the positive is larger than the negative. On the other hand, it's minus if, on the other hand, x is bigger than the y, right? Does that make sense? One's a, a larger positive, smaller negative is positive, but a smaller positive, larger negative is negative, and they behave differently. And so what I'm going to do is call this subcase 1 and subcase 2. So subcase 1. What happens if my positive quantity magnitude wise is larger than or equal to my negative quantity, right? That's that A from up above, right? The positive number is bigger than my negative number. Then or non-negative is bigger than the negative. Non-negative larger than the negative quantity. And I mean by larger, I mean further from zero. Then the absolute value of x plus y is simply x plus y. And x plus y is a positive number. Okay. So consider absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y is supposed to be greater than or equal to the absolute value of x plus y. What's the absolute value of x? We're still in the same case. We're still here. So what's the absolute value of x? So we have negative x plus what's the absolute value of y? y is this greater than or equal to what's the absolute value of x plus y? It's x plus y. Is that true? Look at the left. What is this number? Positive. What is this number? Positive. What is this number? Positive, and those are the same number, right? What is this number? Negative. What is going on? I have the number y on both sides, both of which are positive. On the left, I add a positive number. On the right, I subtract. Is the left bigger than the right? Is y, is y plus something bigger than, a positive something, bigger than y minus? Yes. So this is true. Subcase 2. What if the absolute value of x is larger than the absolute value of y? We have a bigger negative number. If that's true, then the absolute value of x plus y, which is actually a subtraction, is a negative number. And so I have to throw on the extra minus to make it a positive. Here we go with that. All right. So now let's consider what's the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y. Is it indeed greater than or equal to the absolute value of x plus y? Well, what's the absolute value of x again? Minus x. What's the absolute value of y? Y. Is this greater than or equal to minus x plus y? Well, again, I could take that minus through on the right. This is negative x plus y. Is this indeed greater than or equal to a minus x plus a minus y? What is this? Pause. What is this? Pause. What is this? Pause. x is negative. Minus x is now positive. What is this? Negative. And these are the same. 
So a positive number plus a positive number is that bigger than that same positive number minus a number. Addition is bigger than subtraction, right? If we do that, and so again, this is true. So are all three cases true? Yes. If I pick two numbers on the left, the tri triangular inequality holds. If I pick two numbers on the right, the triangular inequality holds. If I pick a number on the left or the right, no matter which one's further from zero, the triangular, the triangular inequality also holds. So therefore, it's true. I handled all possibilities of picking a triangular inequality. Now, compare this to what they have in the back. What they have in the back goes through the same reasoning process but they don't formalize, say, this is why I'm picking case one. This is why I'm picking case two. This is why I'm picking case three. They have a lot of minuses appearing and disappearing without people getting it. Well, it's right. It's just a little bit harder to follow. That's one of the things about proofs. A proof technique is a lot of times stylistic. <clears throat> a lot of the words I said here would also be words that you would write down. This is what the absolute value means. This is why I'm doing this. And there's always a question of how detailed should you go? Well, the question is, is it what helps you understand it? Gauss was a famous mathematician for trying to remove everything except the pure logic of the proof. He didn't consider a proof done until you couldn't figure out if there's anything extra, like trying to explain it, that would be erased. So a lot of people would have his proof, and it's like, how did you think about this? Why did you understand that I was supposed to take two numbers on the left and two numbers on the right and one number on the left and right, which could be possibly different sizes and their subtractions that it could be negative or positive? Well, he would erase all that until all that's left is the pure math and people would say, I can't recreate this because they couldn't see how he thought. So this is one where you kind of break it down to the thought process. Is everybody okay with it? how at least the answer in the back of the book came about? Okay. It's also a good example of uh, what's called backwards reasoning. You have an answer in the back of the book, and you're like, how did you get that? Well, sit down and write down one of their things and ask, what must have happened for this to occur? What's going on? And then think hard about it. It's like kind of going to the problem. Any other questions? All right. Exam one. Exam one, we are going to have 10 problems plus <coughs> one extra credit. All right, the way the extra credit works is the extra credit is going to be a problem. I'm going to tell you exactly what it is when we get to it. It's going to be with you know, some tweaks or things like that. The extra credit is a hard problem. But I'm going to tell you exactly what it is. When you do it on the test, if you choose to do it, it has to be either 100% right or 100% wrong. Right? If you just make, you know, oh, I wrote a wrong word, and it's, yeah, it's wrong. Zero, I'm not going to worry about it. It's extra credit. The idea is by studying for this, since I'm telling you exactly what it is and it's a hard problem, you'll actually be able to do many of the other problems because it's like a study tool, right? And so you can choose to either ignore it or not. It's extra credit. All the others are partial credit, right? I go through here. Partial credit's always fun in that, that, especially when you start to get verbose. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just going to write a lot of words, hopefully confuse him, and then he'll give me partial credit. See, I wrote two paragraphs worth of stuff. Okay. None of it makes any sense, right? So I know that happens a lot. That's the, that's the typical argument technique, isn't it? You get into an argument with somebody, and they just keep talking and talking and talking and talking until you're like, shut up, I quit, yay, you win. Right? I don't want to hear you anymore. Right? But I don't do that. Because at that point, it's like, you have no idea what you're doing, zero, move on. Right? But it's, it makes it interesting, because it's, it, it's an interesting question of, do you not know what's the logical mistake, what are you not getting, to try and find it? Partial credit's fun in that way. It'd be easier if it was just zero or, or ten. But anyways, 
Um, the way these problems work is there's some hard problems that I'll go in here and say this is ten, this is a work, right? If you're going to get this or understand it, and some of them are going to be you came to class, you did the homework, you understand it. This is something that you should know, and if you did not know how to do it, I ought to send you a little note that's saying there's a really interesting question at this particular point. If you cannot make the truth table that everybody should know, and you don't even know where to begin, we need to have a talk because this is a fourth of the semester. You know, we're in four exams that you've just thrown away, right? So that's the level of spread here. Um, there are essentially five sections in here. We'll break them up uh, for 1.1 and 1.2 for propositional logic. Prob, prob, propositional logic, which is really, do you understand the variables? Do you understand... Uh, the operations, you know, variables like assigning variables, P denotes my name is Paul, you know, however you want to do it. Tables, can you make up a, a truth table after you do your operations, orders of operations, etc. Applications. All right, for these two sections, we're only going to have two problems. Problem one of these two sections is literally going to be this. I'm going to write it. The truth table everyone should know. Well, obviously you're just going to put down a bunch of T's and F's, right? But I really mean, what I mean know, knowing for moving forward is about, do you know why this true is here? Do you know why this false is here? What's going on about the operations? On the other hand, we've done this in class. I've already talked about it. We've shown it. I'm just going to say, draw the truth table. If you give me the truth table, everybody should know. And that's all I'm going to say. Right? Please don't leave it blank. Were you expecting? Were you expecting like the truth table? No, the truth table. Everybody should know, which would be no. How many people have been in class and I mentioned it, did, and I've written it? How many variables? Two. How many operators? All. All. Right. I did that in the lecture, and I wrote this is the truth table. Everyone should know, and I wrote it down. And it's if you go to online to. Chaos.math.wichita.edu slash 321. That's all the recordings for all my class for 321, even the 830. And if you want to what, listen to my 830 class, it's not that big of a difference. All right? And then see the PDFs. There'll be a PDF in there. You've got to find the right one. It'll say, hey, look, here's the truth. They'll let you know. And I said it in class. Do you think I meant it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I meant it. It wasn't a joke. You, this is the truth table. Everybody should know. How many people think that they could do it right now? Yeah. Okay. If, if you have your hand up and somebody else beside you does not, meet them after class. All right. I don't want to write it down because I expect people to have actually did the... All right. Okay. And the second one is going to be a multi-part problem. Uh, can you go from English into symbols, and can you go from symbols back to English? And this has multiple parts. You know, for example, on this one, you know, I might give you something, you know, blah, blah. And, and then blah, then blah. Right? You're going to do all this sort of stuff. You're going to go through here and say, oh, look, I'm going to say that Q denotes, and then you're going to pick something, right? You're going to say R denotes. You see an and, that's going to be an or. That's a then. There's an imply, right? Mm -hmm. And then what I want to see is you tell me what Q is. You tell me what R is. Or uh, Don't pick P's and Q's, right? Pick something that makes sense, right? And then you would go through the symbols and say, oh, okay, this is uh, Q and R implies T, you know, something like that. Where you tell me what Q is, you tell me what R is, you tell me what T is, and then you put the symbols in all appropriately. Now I'm not going to probably, I'm going to pick an and, I might pick a but, I might pick a yet, I might pick an or, I might pick an unless, I might pick an if, then, only if, sufficient, necessary, if, you know, if and only if, which is a biconditional, right? Every possible English thing for the operators, outside the weird ones, right, I'm going to pick things like if, only if, necessary, sufficient, or unless, uh, and, but, yet, if and only if necessary and sufficient. 
right? Those would be of the ones, right? So we need to be able to do all of those and put them into the operators. And not, or none, or no for the negation, right? And it's, you're going to pick this. Now, please do not do something like this. P denotes the entire thing, and then you write P, <laughs> right? You could, that'd be like, what, probably two points out of ten, <laughs> right? But if you see operators, I want to see operators, right? Uh, going, and then obviously, we're going to go like this. This is, this direction is English to symbol, and I'll have another part where you'll go backwards, that's symbol to English. I'll give you symbols and then you spit it back out. I will probably restrict your English. I'll say things like, please say the words necessary, say, or you maybe use sufficient instead of if and that. So if it has an implied, oh look, if, r, then, t. No, I want you to use the word necessary. So what would you rather say? T is necessary for r. That's what I want to hear. So I might restrict your wording so that you know how to use words like, I, I've checked. You know how to use the word necessary. And you know how to use the word sufficient. All right, uh, 1.3 are logical equivalencies. Uh, there will be two problems here as well. All right, the first problem is going to be you're going to show that two things are logically equivalent, and you should know the three techniques. What are the three techniques to show a logical equivalency? Step one is truth table is a tautology. Step two, show that in the exact same conditions, the two sides are true, or maybe the exact same conditions, the two sides are false. Right, and the third is use older logical equivalencies, right? We have these three techniques. Uh, if I had enough time, I would probably do something like this. I would make you do all three. And I'd pick something easy. It's like, okay, show, not, I just know all three, but I'm going to pick one, right? Not all three. I'll tell you which one. For example, show that P implies Q is actually P and not Q, right? Uh, Technique one, technique number one would be you'd have a P and a Q, blah, 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 and over here you would have do some work, and then you would get this whole not P, whoops, not P implies Q, biconditional with P and not Q, and what do you get? A tautology, right? You would do all this work and you would get a tautology on the biconditional, therefore it should be logically equivalent. That's, you know, that would be proving by using a truth table. On the other hand, technique number two would be an explanation. So you would sit there and say, okay, P and not Q is only true when what? When's the only time a conjunction is true? When the left is true and the right is true. So when P is true and not Q is true. But what does that tell you about P and Q then? So only true when P is true, Q is what? False. Everybody okay with that? Okay, when's the left? That's the right side. Okay, what about when is not P implies Q? True. When's that? When does that happen? <coughs> when P implies Q is false. But when's the only time implication is false? Only when P is true, Q is false. Hey, look! It's only true under those conditions. Whoops. Whoops. Whoa. Stop it. It's only true... Come here. 
It's only true in these conditions, and it's only true in those conditions. Are they the same conditions? Yes, so they have to be logically equivalent. Are we okay with that? In technique three, would be not P implies Q is logically the same thing as not not P or Q. What did I use? The disjunctive form of implication. That's logically not not P and not Q. What did I use? De Morgan's. But that's the same thing as P and not Q. I use double negation. So is the left the right? Yes. By the disjunctive form of implication, De Morgan's law and double negation, they are the same thing. That's using older logical equivalents. Be able to do all three techniques. All right? And then I will say, do, do tables to show that these are the same, logically the same. Or explain that they're both true in the same conditions or both false in the same conditions to show that they're logically equivalent. Or use older logical equivalencies to show that they're logically equivalent. I will pick one. But if you could do all of these three that I just showed you for this problem, you would at least, if you understood it completely, I'm ready, I know at least, you just have to be, how good are you at, at knowing them? Problem two, on the other hand, from this section, is going to use, basically it's like technique three, use logical equivalencies. Kind of like that. Like this example, except harder. Right? The last one, oh look, this is De Morgan's. This is distribution. This is, and you keep going down and down and down and down and down until you get to an end. I'll tell you where you to start and where the end is. But what you need to do is, so you'll know if you're right, unless all of a sudden you just say what a lot of people do, triple line, random stuff, triple line, random stuff, triple line, the answer. You know, don't, don't do that. To get stuck, stop. Right? Figure out which is the next, you know, logical equivalency. It'd be like start off with one. Oh look, I'm gonna use the Morgans. Oh look, I'm gonna use distribution. Oh you I'm gonna use the distribution under implication. I'm gonna use domination. I'm gonna use identity. You know, here'd be for example, what if we had things like uh, P and Q implies P or R where P is true. Could you simplify that? This is an example problem, problem from the praxis, which would be for those that are wanting to teach high school, you have to pass that. So you look at that and say, okay, I'll replace things with their equal. That's true and Q implies true or R. So that's logically what's true and Q just plain old Q, because that's the identity property. And a true does nothing implies, but what's true or R? True, because that's the domination. What's anything implies true? True, trivially. That's a trivial truth, right? If it was false implies anything, you would have had true, because that's vacuous. Anything implies true is true, that's trivial. So look, hey, that entire thing, if P is true, is a tautology. Right? That'd be something along. You know, we're using logical equivalencies. You don't have to name what you did. I used domination. I used identity. I used distribution. I used uh, De Morgan's. I, you know, eh. Just know what you did. You don't have to necessarily remember the name. <coughs> All right. Uh, for 1.4 and 1.5. This is quantification. We only have one problem. It's a multi-part problem, though. Where we're going to go from English into symbols and back. And this is, again, multiple parts. All right, if you go from English into symbols, you know, I'll have words like, Everyone likes to take Math 321 as long as it's, it's uh, always going to serve donuts for every class. 
right? You know, something like that. You have, oh, look, there's the word everyone. There's Obviously, when we're going into symbols, the symbols are no longer, we extend out the problem, right? The symbols of the previous section were things like P, Q, and R, right? This, these propositions. These include now new propositional functions, right? Now, now do we just not have things like P and Q where they specify a sentence? We now have a propositional function. Like L of X comma Y is X loves Y, right? And along with propositional function includes the universe of discourse. So if I said everyone in this class is going to eat a donut that I bring, and if I would restrict you in the problem to say the universe of discourse needs to be all Wichita State University students, you now have a predicate being in this class, right? For all students at the university, if they are in this class, then they eat a donut. And so you then have these like a, a universal quantification, Predicates on, you know, are they students, you know, and we'll have ands and implies. And so the idea is, like, for the symbols, we're going to have functions and universes of discourse, which either I'm going to give you or you state yourself. And obviously the other way. You know, we would have things like, I'm going to put it for all and maybe tweak it a bit and switch the order of the quantifications and say it in both different ways, right? So basically like the homeworks that you've seen. Um, then for 1.6, which is rules of inference, we are going to have two problems. All right, the first problem for the rules of inference is going to be, is it a valid argument. The it is, I give you an argument. I'm going to give you an argument. Premise, 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 conclusion. And the question is, is it, is it valid? If the answer is yes, I don't, I want beyond yes and no, right? I'm going to have, you know, the idea is there's going to be here is a why. Right? If it's yes, what should you tell me? Pre premise one with premise two and modus ponens, you know, is, is affirming the hypothesis I get this and I do that, I get this. Okay, if it's no, I've going I will have used a fallacy. So if the answer is no, this is not a valid argument. You use the fallacy of. So you tell me what fallacy I use. Right? So if it's yes, you got to tell me how it became to be yes. And if it's no, you're going to tell me why, what fallacy was used in this particular argument. Um, the second problem is I will just simply give you premises, state, conclusions, state your valid conclusions. I will tempt you to use fallacies. I will give a different look of a modus ponens, you know, in terms of that whole not, you know, not P or Q is the same thing as P implies Q. I won't give you, an, and if then, I might give you a, you know, something like that. And I will tempt you to affirm, what's, what's the fallacies? Affirming the conclusion is a fallacy. You're not supposed to do that. Denying the hypothesis, you're not supposed to do that. I will tempt you to do that, period. Because I know about a third of the class will just simply, oh, look, and you'll just run right to one of the fallacies. So just so you know, one of those will be dangling out there. In other words, it'll like, ooh, I want to. You can't draw a conclusion from that. You would just simply skip it. It didn't give me anything. Right? So you kind of try to come up with as many valid conclusions as you can. Uh, 1.7 and 1.8 are just going to be a bunch of proofs. We will have three problems. Obviously, the first everybody knows. Square root of 2 is irrational. And also prove use lemma. The whole n squared is even implies n is even. Right? Prove that as well. 
Uh, the second one is going to be a for all x, p of x, where the universe of discourse <laughs> is finite. We did the, like one like that last class. Like all the numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4 have this property. Oh, plug into 1, plug into 2, plug into 3. It's a proof by cases, right? It's going to be it's going to be algebraic. And the third is an existential proof. We have two techniques, so please be able to do a constructive and be able to do a non-constructive. Constructive is literally find the thing that I'm talking about or prove what I'm talking about. There is some, like we did in class, so like there's a square beside a cube, right? Oh, look, eight and nine, found it, right? You know, something along the you know, ideas of finding it somehow in the non-constructive, is that whole square two, square two, square two, square two, square two, you know, example that we did in, in the text is also the variation of that that's in the homework. You know, and that whole idea of proof by cases is also that whole for all x, p of x, where the universe of discourse is finite. You know, not only is that the true of like algebraic, you know, the triangular inequality is also algebraic, right? And we all know how to do that. That's probably way, way too much time. You know, it took about 10, 15 minutes. When you have uh, 10 problems in 50 minutes, I only get about five minutes of problem. Of course, it's five minutes of writing and thinking. So normally you try to make your test problems like they average out to about you know two to three minutes of thinking with you know two to one minutes of writing is normally what you try to do. Ideally, we wouldn't have a time limit. I would just simply say, here's this. Show me all three techniques in terms of showing things are logically equivalent. You know, trial is different proofs. So you have the time to do it until you relax and you show your abilities rather than under a time constraint. But we don't. We only have 50 minutes. All right, the extra credit is going to be page 80. Do, 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 do. Is on page 80. It's going to be number 34. Except, but, a couple of changes. One, do won't do all that whole 34a to 34e right there's what one two three four five five there's five sub problems to 34 it's a star problem it's difficult right what it is is here are two pre they give you two premises and then they ask are these is the first conclusion valid or not is the second conclusion valid or not so for each, every one of these, it's going to be, it's valid by such and such. It's invalid because they must have used this fallacy, right? And so they go through five of those. The other change that I'm going to do is I'm going to change object words. You know, for example, the textbook itself talks about logic, and they say things like, logic is difficult or not many students like logic. If mathematics is easy, then logic is not difficult. I'm going to change object words. I'll do things like maybe, I don't know, you know, logic can be turned into sports and math gets turned into soccer. The reason why I'm doing that is to prevent memorization. Right? Now look, because I know the answer is online. Right? Everybody in here can go online. Every one of these textbooks says every problem it's ever done is Go online. And actually, if you want to pay for it, there's even websites that you can go online. Please do all my homework for me. I love getting Fs for my classes and spending money, right? Because it's pretty hard to replicate an exam if you don't do anything, right? But on the other hand, people will try to memorize this. I'm not interested in memorizing it. So you're going to do these techniques. You know, if the first one is, is valid, it's going to be valid for, you know, why is this particular thing valid? What's going on? And I'll switch up the order, too, obviously. I won't put it in A, B, C, D, E, right? You'll have to know why things are going on in the way that they are. So it won't, you know, if you do this, it's a star problem. If you do these problems and you know how 
why they're valid and why they're not valid, you know, you'll have definitely been prepared for those two, right? Because those, those will be easier than that one. So just by attempting the extra credit and getting it, you know, working it out and talking about it and thinking about it, it's studying for this. And it's studying for the operators. That's one of the things I, the reason why I have the extra credit, it's a carrot to make you study. Right? And it's either right or wrong. All right. Any questions on these? Monday. Monday. So, that's it. No, it's the exam. <laughs> <laughs> the attendance problem is you do it in class and you'll call it the exam. All right, go ahead and hand your attendance up.